Glorious Black. Delighted to say that we've got another great guest on tonight. We've managed to keep the standard tight. Tonight I'm joined by ex-Hibs Cup winning hero Mickey Weir, also ex-Luton, Millwall and Motherwell. Mickey, first of all, thanks very much for coming on my podcast. No, no problem, Lewis, no problem. We'll just go uh, right back to the start, Mickey. Uh, when you were playing with the school team and you're also playing Sunday football, was that for Pilton Sporting? Yeah, I played with, uh, when I was really young, I played with Pilton Sporting Club, just a, a Sunday football team that I joined early and as a young man. Uh, it was just just an occasion, actually, one of my mates came to the door and asked if I'd like to play it. And to be fair, I was a wee bit, uh, I kind of fell out of love with football at that time, Lewis, you know. So uh, a couple of wee guys came to, my, came to my door and asked if I'd like to play for the team. So I went along and I loved it. Uh, a guy called Ian Dayton, I better, me, I better mention him, I don't know, I'll be happy. Many years ago and he got me playing, so yeah, that was the start of it. So how early on, Mickey, did you re- realise that you were a bit different to other kids, that you were maybe a level above other kids. I never, I never really looked at it that way, Lewis. You know, I never really looked at being better than anybody else or anything like that. Uh, I certainly think when I was younger, really young, at primary school and that, uh, I was, I was, I thought it was natural, Lewis. You know, it was, I thought the natural stuff. I wasn't like, I never got any kind of coaching or anything like that. I thought it was natural, uh, and I took a sort of. I took a couple of years out of the game because of just the certain situation where I was being told that I was too small to play, you know, so I kind of got a wee bit disheartened with it, gave it up. But I always, always believe that uh, when I was really young, that's that's when I was at my best. I was defi- I definitely lost a good, I would say, maybe 20% of my game simply because I gave up for, I think it was a couple of years, near enough. So I always say that that was 20% of my game that I kind of lost. Do do you think now with the the pro youth, Mickey, that that's why other kids are a bit like yourself? That players with natural ability, it's maybe getting coached out of them. Well, I've always said that at a young age, I believe you've just got to let them go and play with freedom. Now, I'm not against uh, coaching. You know, I'm not. I'm not all against coaching because you do need some of it. But I think at a young age. Uh, you've got to let them go and play with a freedom and, and just let them go and enjoy the game because I think uh, I think a lot of young players can be they can get they can get baffled with the game and it kind of they can chase them away from the game you know too too much tactics and coaching and that type of stuff certainly if I was if I look at myself when I was younger I think if I'd have walked into some of the sessions I've seen with young young boys I think to be honest with you I'd have walked away I wouldn't have that wasn't for me you know because yeah, I wasn't that. I wasn't that clever, you know. So too many cones and discs and things like that would have kind of put me off, and that's been serious. And I always looked at that my way, when I was involved in youth coaching as well. But yeah, you've got to do a wee bit of coaching and that. But I don't think it's especially at a young age. I don't think it's a be all and end all. I think you've got to let the players play their own game. You know, my dad used to always say to me, you know, go and play your own game. You know, I'd ask him, what, what can I do? What do I want to do, Dad? He'd just say to me. Just play your own game, son. Play your own game, and that's what I did. And I, and I believe in that. I still believe in that today. So you spent a couple of years at, at Porty Thistle. You're saying that you fell out of love with the game. Was there a turning point where you you fell back in love with football, Mickey? Yeah, it was simply it's, it's same type of thing. Lewis, you know, one of my friends asked me to go and play for Saint Augustine's High School. But it was actually a it was a trial session with it for the school. And he asked me to come along and play, and it was for the B team at St Augustine's High School. Uh, and I always kid them on because when I went along, uh, I got in a, and I got asked to go into the A team after a wee while when he got left in the B team. <laughs> so he was not happy, you know. But uh, it was him that got me back to the back to playing again. And then I was very lucky because I had a great I had a great coach at the time, uh, Con Dugan, who kind of straightened me out to be fair, Lewis, because I was. At that time, I was, I was, I just wanted to win at everything. You know, I had a, I had a hunger to win at everything. And uh, my first couple of games at St Augustine's School, uh, I was, I remember one time a guy had a boy had a bit of a kick at me, so I just, I was chasing him round the park for the next half an hour, near enough twenty minutes, just trying to kick him. You know, and so I had a good heart to heart with him, with Con Dugan, uh, my teacher on the Monday, and he, he told me, 
you can't play for my team if you're going to be like that, Michael. You need to, you know, and concentrate and play football. See, he was a big help to me, Lewis. So you were a, a Hibs fan growing up, Mickey. What's your best memories of being a young lad and and going to watch the Hibs? Uh, it was it was fantastic. You know, when I was young, I was you know I was lucky enough to go and go to see a great couple of good sides. You know, playing in Europe and going with my granddad, my dad, my uncles, and being behind the goal beside the big floodlights. The European nights, I always remember the European nights. I was very young, but I can just remember it was just magical, you know, just the floodlights on the pitch and running down to the running down to the corner flag to see the players taking a corner kick. You know, just as a young person it was it was great and I was very fortunate to see a lot of very good players when I was younger, you know, and, and the standard that, that was set from that day from there to watching the Hibs always stuck with me, you know. I, I believe the Hibs should be up there with the best in Scottish football and I'm still like that today, Lewis. So who, who were some of the, the good players that you watched back then, Mickey? Who is it that you admired? Well, my hero at the time was uh, Alec Edwards. I loved Alec Edwards simply because he was just uh, he used to take all the corner kicks and that and free kicks, so I would just run down and I could always remember him you know, just this guy who could pass a great ball, great cross of the ball. He just had that bit of class about him, just he just had an arrogance about him that I loved as a young player, as a young man watching him. He just was so confident in his ability. I just loved watching him. So he was one. There was obviously other ones, Pat, the great Pat Stan, and so many good players at that, in that time. But I was fortunate to see all these good players week in, week out with us, you know, and it was, I was very, I was spoiled, really. So eventually, um, there became interest from the club that we've just been talking about, Hibs. How did that come about, Mickey? Well, I've been playing with my, my St Augustine's High School and then I got asked to go and play with Portobello Thistle. And I was only there for a matter of months, maybe one season, maybe just... Yeah, I need to look back, but I can't remember the actual dates, but I wasn't there too long before. I was asked to go and play in a, a one-off game at Easter Road. It was a uh, Edinburgh against uh, Hibs Eleven sort of thing, sort of mixed teams. Uh, so I played and obviously did okay. And then a couple of days later on, I got a phone call from Pat Stanton from my dad and asked me if I'd like to to sign for Hibs, which I couldn't believe at that time, you know, because I was just I was just happy enough to go and play Easter Road and this stadium playing in the great on the Hibs pitch was just amazing to me and then. When I got the phone phone call for Mr. Stanton, it was just surreal, really. Your dad must have been really proud to, you know, when Pat Stanton, probably the biggest Hibs legend that could could have phoned your dad. I mean, how was that for your family, Mickey? Uh, it was amazing, amazing. My granddad and my dad. Uh, and to be fair, Lewis, I never really had any choice, you know. <laughs> as soon as my dad knew that Hibs were in, that was it. It was done deal, you know. It was... Uh, and obviously Paddy Stanton was my dad, one of my dad's heroes, you know, so he was more excited than me, you know, he's going to see Pat Stanton and going along to the ground, there was a 16 year old boy going in to meet Pat Stanton and Jimmy Rook, George Stewart, real top Hibs players, you know, legends of the, of the club. So it was a, it was an amazing time and just to, to, but to, to, re, to think where how far I came from just playing boys club football, you know, and then Suddenly, I'm, I'm on the ground staff at Hibs at 16 year old, and I uh, just couldn't believe it. At that time, I just couldn't believe it. But I thought, you know what? While I'm in here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give everything. They're gonna have to throw me out the doors. They're gonna have to throw me out because I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. I'm, I just what I wanted to strive to get the first game to play for Hibs. Just play one game. I would have been more than happy with that. So, what was life like as a young apprentice with the Hibs, Mickey? Uh, Fantastic! It was just times that will live you forever. You never, you never get, you never, it never ceases to amaze me when people ask me about these the things that we used to get up to and the ground staff was just it was mad, really. You know, you done all your work. You done all, it was a hard work, Lewis. Trust me, it was hard work. Apprenticeship in the days. You done all your, you know, you done all the strips. You done the terraces. You done everything. And sometimes you would miss training just to do some painting. Whatever it may be, you know, you'd miss a couple of days training just to get out. You were just treated like a dog's body, but I loved it because the camaraderie we had at the time with Paul Kane and guys like that, 
on the ground stuff was great. They were all hub supporters as well. Most of us were hub supporters, so yeah, it was great times. And I just wish that uh, I've always said I think that was a loss to the game. I think a lot of young players could be doing with that nowadays, just to get just to let them realise how lucky they are to become a football player. You know. Uh, I think John Collins also ended up signing a wee bit yeah. after after you, Mickey. I mean, what was he like as a young lad? He's always been come across as super fit, super professional. Was he like that as a young lad? Yeah, to be fair, Lewis, we were all like that. We had to be, you know, we all had to work hard at the game. And people think that he just, you know, it was all down to talent. It was more than that. You know, we, John was a great trainer. Paul came was a great trainer. So many of them. But I remember we'd have to train all day. And then Tuesday and Thursday, we'd go to Meadowbank Stadium and do sprint training right after training, you know. So it never come easy for us, Lewis, you know. We... We really worked hard at it. You just gave it everything you could, and if you weren't good enough, then you could put your hand up and say, well, I gave it a lot. But every single one of the players that came through all worked hard at it, you know, all worked in being physically, it was a physically demanding game, you know, and you had to be, especially myself, I knew that I had to go and do a lot of work in the gym. But Johnny was, yeah, he was a, he was a very good, strong character as well, which you do need as a young man to work a lot of strong characters that wanted to be football players, you know, what to play for the Hubs, and that was a big thing. Did you settle in quickly, Mickey, or did you find it tough at any point when you first went in in terms of like the standard of football and the standard of training? Oh yeah, it was it was hard. At first when you walked in you're you know, playing you're playing in the seven a sides and you're playing with top players, you know, and I've just come out for like boys clubs so your game had to had to move up a level very quickly, you know, you were I was playing with, and Paddy Stanton would join in. Paddy Stanton, the manager, would join in, and he was better than all us. You know, he was, he was the best player. <laughs> he was unbelievable, Pat. So, no, you, your game had to had to go up a level very quickly, you know, but it's amazing when you're playing with real top pros that how your game does go up, you know. It's got to, or, or, you, it just, or you'll just drift through it, as simple as that. If you don't, if you don't, if your game doesn't, go up a notch then you'll you'll struggle, you know. What what was Pat Stanton like as a coach? Was he obviously he's known as a quiet man, was he quiet during the training or was he was he quite hard on you, Mickey? Uh, Pat, Pat Pat never said a lot with us, you know, but one thing about Pat if if Pat, if he said something to you, you had to listen, you know, you would listen. Jimmy Root was the man who uh, uh, had a lot of time for me. Jimmy Jimmy was a Rottweiler. Jimmy would have a go at you. He would really have a go at you. Big George Stewart you ran away from Big George Stewart. <laughs> he didn't say much to Big George. Just, but Pat, Pat was a, a many. He was a man of very, very few words. But when he did speak, there was always there was always a lot of golden nuggets there. You know, just three simple things that he would say to you, and you, you had to put take it on board. But he was not a no. He was not a rat and a raver. He was just a. He just had a bit of class about everything he done. He was just class with Pat. You know, and he's still like that today. I think your first appearance in a hip strip was a, a 7 0 defeat to Aberdeen in the reserves. What are your, your memories of that game? Oh yeah, that was a that was a night I'll never forget. I beat seven 0 to Aberdeen and went home and thought, I'm not good enough. You know, that's the way I looked at it. I thought I'm I don't think I'm good enough here because it was devastating, you know, but there the midfield, it was unbelievable that night. They were all I think the week after Lucy were playing, they were ready to play a European tie. And some of them were wanting to get in the squad or get in the team or be about the squad. So they were absolutely flying, you know, and they were ruthless, absolutely ruthless. But Pat Stanton did that, had a great, had a wee chat with us, I think it was on the Monday, had a chat with us and said, you know, that's that's what it's all about. Put that behind you because you're playing against experienced players who played in European football, played in title challenges, they've been through it all. So you just got to learn for it and get through it and uh, and it's a great learning for you and that's what you've got to do and that's what I did. It made the you either it made me more determined, you know, it made me much more determined to think, you know, I know what standards to get to now, I know what I've, I've got to do, so I'll get a real go. But yeah, it was a it was a tough one, but I learned so much from it. Do you think that's maybe missing from young players? Because obviously now you've got like the under twenty threes under 21s, but obviously, if you said they are playing against guys like that, it must have brought your game on. Yeah, it was a 
I've said for a long time with to a lot of people that I think the biggest detriment to Scottish football has been the loss of the Reserve League, you know. When I was 16, 17, and boys like myself and Kano's and Johnny Collins and Gordon Hunters, Willie Millers, I could go through all of them. We all started in the reserves playing with experienced players alongside you and against you, you know, and the learning you get from that, you just can't buy. You know, I've always said that, in my opinion, I don't think a 17-year-old player can tell a 17-year-old player how to play football. It just, just doesn't work. You know, you need older heads around about you to to learn you the game. Uh, for all your coaching and that, Lewis, you know, you can do as much coaching as you want, but playing in these games against real top pros, uh, you just can't kind of buy. And I think you learn more from maybe four or five reserve games than you'd have 10, 15, 20, under 23 games, you know, because as I say, you're playing against players who, who know what the game's all about, they know how to win. And you have to learn that quickly as well. You have to learn how to win. You know, in reserve league, you had to learn how to win because the players beside you would, they would tell you, you know, if you if you made bad passes or you weren't, you were being lazy or whatever it may be, they would be on top of you, and that that's a learning for you as a young player. You know, that's what I found, and I think most most players who played reserve football will tell you that. Who were the good senior pros in that Hibs first team at that time, Mickey? Oh, I was, I was very fortunate. I had a lot of good, and I'm a great believer that you need good, experienced professionals, you know, good types. You know, I had, like say, Gordon Ray, Jackie McNamara, Ralph Carrigan, Arthur Duncan, way back, Arthur Duncan, Eric Shadler, you know, so many of them that played at top, top pros. And but they also taught you to have respect for people, you know, that was that was a big, you had to have respect for folk and you never got above your station, never ever did you get above your station or they would be on top of you, but they were all great, great players, great professionals, you know, Ali Brazil was another one, Benny Brazil, who I got on great with and he was hard with me, he was tough with me at times, but I had a lot of respect for him because he was. A, they were real good professionals and you need that as a young man. So you go on to make your debut in a 3-1 win in the cup against Airdrie. What are your memories of that game, Mickey? Well, it was unbelievable, actually. I was actually doing a, I was a, doing my apprentice, my apprenticeship work. I was I was cleaning the terrace and and whatever we were doing at that time, and and the manager just came over to me and said, "Come here, son, over you come." And I went over and I said, uh, "Jane, you can play left back tonight." And I said, "Ah, no problem. I'll play left back." You know, I was saying myself, I was saying, you know, I'll play in goals, I'll play anywhere. He says, right, get yourself ready, I'll pick, we'll get you picked up, whatever it may be, and played Airdrie, and he played me at left back. Uh, so I just went along and, and done the best I could. I thought, no, I'm playing for the Hubs, I've got a chance. Unbelievable for, for, for cleaning the, you know, the terrace, and then suddenly I'm playing that night in the first team. But that happened a few times for us, you know, it happened a few times, we would be cleaning the dugouts or cleaning the terraces and then you'd be told you're in the squad or you're playing tonight, today or whatever. It happened a few times for us, but that was one, yeah, it was a, it was unbelievable feeling having to get the bus home to Clarence and to tell my dad that I'm, I'm playing tonight, you know, get yourself ready. They all went come through to watch me playing. Yeah, it was a, it was a big, it was a big moment in my, in my life, you know. Was it hard to keep your feet on the ground, Mickey, after your first appearance? Or were you brought back down to earth by the, the manager and the senior players? Yeah, you never ever got above your station, never ever. They, 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 they'd say well done or whatever it was, but they never ever, you know, they never got you too, they never let you go too far away from yourself, you know, they didn't get too big-headed or whatever you want to be, they never allowed that to happen. It just wasn't the way then, Lewis, you know, it just wasn't the way. You never ever thought, oh, I've a, you know, I'm a, I'm a player, I've played 90 minutes for the first team, it just wouldn't happen. You had to keep proving yourself all the time, you know, and like any other young player, we had, young players have dips in form and I had that what the other players just how you come through it you know you either you either sink or you swim you try and keep going but uh, certainly nobody allowed you to get too far ahead of yourself you go on to make your first home appearance Mickey um, and a defeat against Dumbarton which ended up being Pat Stanton's last game yeah. right? you, might, you must have been devastated that, that Pat left obviously a guy that, that brought you to the club yeah, it was. It was a shock, but uh, he'd obviously seen that I wasn't good enough. <laughs> he must have said, "Oh, I can't take this, can't take this any further." Uh, but no, I remember going home and 
getting told that part of the had resigned and it was it was devastating. Uh, because Pat was the one really it was him at it was him and Jimmy O'Rook and George Stewart that kind of gave us the the whole history of Hubs playing for Hubs and what it meant for to play for Hubs, you know, in European games and the discussions we had with him was unbelievable and he, he always gave you great confidence that you could go and play for the first team. But uh, yeah, it wasn't a it wasn't a great great time when I got told they had been they had released. He just resigned because I don't think he think I don't think he thought he could take the club any further, you know. But we always knew that had a lot of good young players, but uh, at that time we were struggling for results. But Lewis, you know, so uh, no, it wasn't a, it wasn't a good time. No. Did you get a chance to speak to Pat once he'd left? Yeah, I know. Oh, I he phoned us all and you know and wished us the best and just gave me a lot of confidence that I could play for the Hibs first team and saying to me, you know, I wouldn't have put you in for the first team if I didn't think you could handle playing for the first team. It's just part of it. You've, you've got to keep going now and uh, keep working at your game. Just gave me great confidence, Lewis, you know. And, but for him to see that, you've got to remember that Paddy is, you know, the king we called him. I, we called him king. I never called him Pat. I called him Pink. Yeah, I called him king, you know. So uh, when the king tells you that you're good enough to play for the Hibs, then you took that. I took that uh, as, as great, a great, a, a great, a uh, a great, what was he, a great respect for me to, to say that he could say to me that I could play for, for Hibs was, was big for me, you know. So John Blackley comes in. How was how yeah. he as a manager and, and as a guy, Mickey? John Blackley was hard, tough, tough. No messing about with John Blackley. Uh, to be fair, I never really got on well with John. John was very hard on the young players. But I realised through time like you do, Lewis, that Sometimes you've got to be hard with young players, you know, and John was a John was a winner, a out and out winner. Uh, tough and if he didn't play well he told you, you know, and he would never hold back. And if he didn't if he expected you to do better than he would tell you and he was always hard with me, very hard with me. Uh, and a number of young players as well. He was a hard with a little bit he was hard with me. For some reason he had uh he what he used to strive for me to do better all the time. And uh but it worked with us, you know, it worked later than I look back now, he was hard with me, but it was for a reason, it was for a good reason, you know, because he knew that I, was a, I had a chance, but he didn't want me to throw it away, and, but as I say, he was really tough, tough with me, and, uh, but I, I, every time I see him now, whenever I see him, I always thank him for it, because he was, he was, he was one of the, he was one of the, the people who drove me on to become a footballer. So as you said, you were, in and out of the team, and you, you went on to make 11, 11 appearances in your first full season. Did you have belief then that you could go and establish, establish yourself as a, a first team player? Yeah, I always had belief, Lewis. I always, never ever, I never ever had a lack of belief to play for Hubs. You know, I always, because I worked hard at my game, I practiced hard, I trained hard, everything you need to do. I always believed if I got a chance. But unfortunately, when John Blackley came and I took a a bad bout of glandular fever which put me out of the game for near enough uh, a season, a whole season near enough. So there was doubts in my mind that I was going to get a contract, you know, I thought I might not get a contract here but when John Blackley moved on, obviously I did, I was lucky enough to get a contract but I, I really thought I was on and it wouldn't have been a surprise to me, Lewis, because I hadn't played a lot of football, you know, I'd, I'd really struggled with glandular fever and at that time, Nobody, nobody knew what that was. It was a kind of new thing that came into the game, you know, and I suffered badly with it. And uh, so I was hanging, I was hanging in for to see if I would get a contract at that time, to be honest. But uh, fortunately, it happened. So you end up uh, making a comeback, and you played in the the famous game against Rangers. I think it was Graham Souness's first game where uh, twenty one players were booked. <laughs> uh, I think you were one of them as well, Mickey. Yeah, uh, it was well. What were your memories of that game? Oh, it was a, it was an amazing game, unbelievable game actually. It was the the support that day was well, Rangers support. I've never seen anything like it. It was unbelievable. Obviously, they were Graham Souness had taken over the club. They were looking to, to to charge it, make a big charge for the title when it came to Easter Road. But uh, they got a shock because. Uh, we weren't just going to lie down to them, you know. It wasn't one of them. We had a lot of good, experienced players on the team at the time, and we just went out there and 
and got amongst it and didn't allow them to, to dominate the game. And it ended up a bit of a, a battle, as you know. It was just a, it was a bit of a war, to be fair. Uh, but a lot of games were like that back in the days. It was, you know, you had to fight your corner and people would... Uh, People would be up for the Rangers or the Celtic and that these big games like that, but it was an amazing. The atmosphere was incredible, especially when when George McCluskey got injured. It, it was it was fever pitch, you know, off the pitch as well. I thought I thought the supporters were going to come on. I thought it was going to be absolute mayhem, but the, the referee managed to calm it down for a bit. But uh, it was an amazing game, and we won the game, which was uh, was even better, you know. Sunes was obviously coming towards the end of his career, but how how good was he as a player? Mickey. Fantastic player. Unbelievable player. Always minds, I've said that a few times when I think it was the first couple of minutes, Lewis, a ball, the goalkeeper kicked the ball up to him and he was playing like five yards away from me, six yards away from me. And he, he took a touch and he half volleyed a pass out to the wide left. I think it would be, uh, I can't mean to play wide left that day. I think it might have been uh, Ted McMinn. I may be wrong, I may be wrong, but I just remember he took this touch and he half volleyed a pass, it was a 30-yard pass, out to the left, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm in a game here. I'm in a real game here because he was his touch, but his touch and his awareness of the game. And he was a he was a nasty bit of stuff as well. You know, he would he would he put it on you within in a heartbeat. But it's just his class on the ball. Just incredible. You gotta remember this guy had won title after title with Liverpool, you know, but it's not really till we play against these type of players that you realise just how good they were, but fantastic player, but what I, what I got out of Graham Sunis was, when I played against him a few times, was he was a winner, he was an out-and-out -out winner, you know, and he just drove himself and drove the team, and if if you weren't a winner on his team, you, were, you wouldn't have lasted much, you wouldn't have lasted long, you know, because he was, but a great player, very good player. So John Blackley uh, leaves the club, Tommy Craig comes in and then Alex Muller. What are your memories of that time, Mickey? Well, Tommy Tommy played a big part in the young players as well because he always done a lot of training with us. We were back every, every afternoon practising, passing every single day. And people, I think a lot of people will look by that now, we you know, but we practised every single day passing drills. For literally hours, Lewis. I mean, hours. We'd be speed pass a ball, twenty, thirty yards to each other for, for hours. Honestly, it was unbelievable. But that's how you get better. Eh? It's a bit like playing golf. You know, if you if you practice at your swing, you get when it comes to actually the game itself, learn how to strike the ball right. Just basic stuff. You know that Tommy. But I always took note of that. Even when I become a coach, I didn't. I, to be honest, I don't think I did enough of that with younger players, which I should have. It was more on the, you know, building them up and getting them stronger or whatever it is. But he taught me the very basics of actually passing the ball properly, you know. And when you've only got like a split second to, and you're playing a game, you've only got a split second to take the ball and pass it. That's when it really matters, Lewis, you know. So he played a big part. And then when Alan, Mur Alan Muller came in, uh, he changed everything about he changed everything about the club, uh, Alan Muller. He was, he was a change... That, that pushed Hibs to a different level. Certainly when he came in, he changed everything. You played in his, his first Edinburgh derby, Mickey, and actually scored in a 2-2 draw. How, how good were the Edinburgh derbies? Obviously, being a fan, did you feel like there was more pressure on yourself being a Hibs fan? <clears throat> yeah, you, you did. Uh, for the sea, you didn't. You'd be telling lies, you know. You, 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 were, you lived away every single day with us as a player. You lived away every single day. But it was great. It was great playing. The Edinburgh Derby's special, very, very special. Unless you've played in them, it's very, it's difficult to let people understand what it's like, you know. I remember my first one just walking out in the pitch and everything, it just, it was unbelievable, the atmosphere, it was fever pitch, you were just out there and you think, this is what it's all about, you know, you've dreamt for playing these games, you go out there, and the game just passes you by, Lewis, because it's so frantic, you know, it's just, when it all costs, and the support, everything about the atmosphere, the game went so quickly, but loved it, loved every minute of the, the, the Edinburgh derbies, didn't love the losing, when I lost the games, it was a nightmare, because you were, you have to, to go into hiding for about a week or something, whatever it may be. 
But I loved it. I loved the big games like that. The Rangers, the Celtic, the Hearts, big games that you know you're putting away your wits against really good players. But the atmosphere of the Edinburgh Derby, nothing, nothing touches it. And, uh, the Hibs Hearts Derby, nothing touches it. For playing for the Hibs, if you're playing for the Hibs, that's that's a big one, you know, playing against the Hearts because it's just the way it is with us, you know. Did you prefer playing in the Derby's Easter Road or Tynecastle, or was it just? Just the didn't, same for you? Nah, it didn't bother me. I got abuse both sides. <laughs> <laughs> I got abuse at both sides. It didn't matter where I played. I played at Tyne Castle, I got dogs abuse. And I went to eight and I played at Easter Road, I got dogs abuse. But I just, I loved it, Lewis. You know, it was, it became water off a duck's back, really, you know, because you've got to be able to deal with that. But certainly, it was before the game, the, the build up to the game, and then after the game, then it was, it was, it could be hard, you know, if you've lost the game, it was like, Heartbreaking because you you've got to speak, you got to deal with different people. You know your family, your friends, heart supporters giving you abuse everywhere, or mm-hmm. even hip supporters coming up to you and saying you were rubbish and whatever it is, and hard to take. But uh, I wouldn't have changed it. No, but the, the derbies are special. Who were some of the good hearts players during that time, Mickey, that you came up against? Played a lot of good players. Played a lot against a lot of good players. Uh, your Gary McKay's and your John Robertson's, these type of players. What I liked about Gary McKay and that t- they type of players were, they were Hearts people, you know. They were Hearts people. They knew what it, what it meant to play for the Hearts, just like myself and Paul Kane, these guys, Gordon Hart and Willie Muller, all these guys, who knew what it meant to play for the Hubs, you know. And So there was a great rivalry there, but it was also the respect. I always had respect for them, you know. Uh, simply because that, they had my derbies, they knew exactly what it was about. So they, they, were, they had a lot of good players with us, you know. John Cahoon is a good player. So many good ones. I can go back to Sandy Clark. But the best player that I played against in an Edinburgh derby, and I've said this many times, was Sandy Jardin. Sandy Jardin that played for Rangers and he came to Hearts and one of my first derbies, eh, no, not one of my first ones, but one of the games I played in, yeah, and I remember the manager having a team talk about it. Right, we've got Sandy Jardin at the back. He's not got any pace. You know, we'll get in behind them. We'll do this. We'll do that. And after the first five minutes, he was taking the ball off the goalkeeper in his own six-yard box. You know, and pinging balls about, <laughs> passing balls about. Absolutely strolled through the game. And I thought, top, just class, real class. So he was a uh, he was the best player I ever seen playing in a derby. You ended up putting a good runny form, Mickey, which resulted in you earning a move to, to Luton Town, who were in the, the top division in England at the time. How did that move come about? Well, I've said that a few times, Lewis. It came about. I was a bit impetuous, to be honest, Lewis. You know, I was uh, I was getting a bit of fed up at times, certain things that were happening in my personal life that were annoying me. And at that time, I was kind of... I wasn't getting on with the manager. It was, a, it was, a, it was a, a number of things that got to me, starting to get to me, you know, and I thought, and when the chance came along, you know, I thought, well, it's the English first division. At that time, it was the big division. I uh, maybe not get another chance of doing this, but uh, I was a bit impetuous and I, I went along with it. Uh, and I, I ended up going down there, but I knew early on that it was I was missing... I was missing the city, you know, I was missing Edinburgh, I was missing the playing for the Hibs, playing against the Hearts and these type of game. I knew early, but the big thing that really changed me was the plastic pitch at Luton. I was, I started to get hamstring injuries and problems with my back and all sorts of stuff. And I was only, I wasn't doing there long, but I knew right away, training and that on the plastic, it was killing me, you know, it was really was. And so I, I decided, you know, I, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be feeling like this every week, every day after training. It was really hard work. So I ended up uh, making my way back up the road. How did you find the standard down there, Mickey? Did you feel that you could fit into that that standard down in England? Well, I found the game very. Sh- I found the game slower in England. You know, it was more technical and slower. Uh, I think the game up in Scotland gets. It's, I think they, they underestimate the game in Scotland, Lewis. You know, because sometimes we maybe know. Technically, as good as a lot of the players doing there, but it's a tough, it's a tough, tough league, the Premier League, you know, and it's the fitness levels of the players, and it was physically, I found it really hard in the Premier League, Scottish Premier League, but down there, I felt at times, to be fair, I felt like I had ten minutes on the ball, you know, I felt like it was like a, 
I just realised, I just thought to myself, you know, I get so much more time in the ball than here. Uh, but played with a lot of good players, a lot of great, really good players, you know, big England internationals and Irish internationals. So I've played with a lot of good players and that, but I found the game a lot more slower and a lot more technical in terms of uh, you're touching the ball and you didn't, they didn't come charging at you, you know, they, they, they sat off you and let you play a wee bit more. Uh, so that's a big that's a big thing I found, yeah. Who were some of the top players that you came up against down there, Mickey, that you managed to, to play oh, against? I played against a lot of good players. I played a lot of form with me, you know. You might say Mick Hartford and Danny Wilson and Mal Donachie, Steve Foster, great players, really good players. On the other side, I came against, like say, who would it be? Stuart Pearce and you know, uh, Brian Robson. All these type of players. Uh, there was there's so many, you know, so many guys. A lot of Scottish players that went down there as well, you know, and. Uh, but, I was unfortunate I never really got to play against them enough, you know, because as I say, I had, that was the time I started to hit problems with my back injury and things like that. So, but there was some really, really good football players, uh, and I learnt a lot in terms of, you know, the changing room. But big personalities in the changing room, you know, Steve Foster and Mal Donaghy, who was a fantastic footballer. He was, but he was hard as nails, hard. Uh, he was a quiet assassin. So you learnt all different characters, you know, and. And they weren't they weren't uh, short of telling you if you weren't doing it right they would be on to you you know because they were they were experienced players I was quite still young at the time so but I enjoyed it I loved the I loved the changing I loved the players loved the club but it just uh, unfortunately I just uh, the training kind of caught up me a wee bit you know it must have been great getting an opportunity so quick to to come back to the Hibs Mickey yeah it was uh, I was I was lucky I was lucky because what had actually happened the story was what I was. Uh, I was in the, I trained in the morning and I went back to my hotel room and I was in agony with us and I was real in pain. I thought, this is not, I can't keep going on like this. So I managed to phone Paul Kane at Hibs uh, and I kept in touch with Kano and I said to him, look, he couldn't put a wee word in because he couldn't ask, see the gaffer, have a word with him and see if he, well, he was quite pal with Peter Cormack at the time, you know, and he said, what do you mean? Like, I said, well, I'm looking, I'd like to come back up the road. Uh, and he said, yeah, I'll do that, so he did that, you know, but the, the crazy thing was, is once it got out, I was I was hoping to go back to the Hibs, I then had a number of offers for teams in England, you know, Aston Villa, Graham Taylor called me, and there was a couple of other teams called me, asked me to stay, so I was I was caught between it, I remember I would have been 48 hours to make my mind up, you know, to go back up the road or to stay, but if you knew my dad, Lewis, you know, it could be very persuasive, you know, and, and my family, I thought, well, you know, I can go back up and play with a team that I've supported and hopefully I'll get everybody back on side because at that time I was getting a bit of stick for, for leaving the club, which was right, right enough, you know, I understand it, I could understand it, but I came back, I managed to say to myself, you know, I made the decision to come back up the road and, and play with the club again. Hibs got a bit of backing at that time and... Um, it ended up with Steve Archibald coming yeah. to the club. What kind of impression did he leave on you, Mickey? Probably the biggest impression a yeah, football player was Steve Archibald. He was the biggest impression in me, definitely. He was, he was just class, he was class with everything. But one thing I did learn from him, and not just me, I think Paul Kane and Johnny Collins, these type of guys would tell you the same thing, was his professionalism, you know. Trained the way he trained, the way he went about his business, practiced his stretching exercises, everything. You know, I thought, well, we don't play with Barcelona and these type of teams if you know what's something about you. But it was his professionalism that really hit home with me how how to treat your body, how to train, and you know, look after yourself. And because at the time I was a wee, but I wasn't the greatest away for the pitch. I wasn't. I wasn't great at eating and my diet and things like that. But when I when I started to see Archibald going about his business, it, it definitely stuck with me and, and and it changed me. It changed my thought process of football completely. And I only played with him. I didn't play with him long, but uh, yeah, he was a big big influence on me. You spoke before about watching uh, before we came on about watching the Tumbles tornadoes in Europe, and you managed to to qualify for the UEFA Cup and and played in a. I think you played in the first leg. 
the first yeah. leg victory. I mean, how was that playing in, in Europe for Hibs? Yeah, it was great. As I say, if, if you'd have said to me when I was 17 year old, Lewis, you know, you're going to go and play for the Hibs and play in the Edinburgh Derbies and play in Europe and play in cup games and cup finals, these type of things, I would never have believed you. Uh, but when playing in Europe is special, you know, and that's why this season I'm hoping that the club can get back into Europe because it's it's so special for the supporters and the players, you know, and you learn so much. I only played a number, a few games in Europe. I wish I'd have played a lot more, but certainly in those games, they're just the learning of how they play the game in Europe, you know, the technical side of it and everything about their game is completely different for us, you know, how we slow the game down and everything uh, was special. But certainly, playing in them was a was a lesson, complete lesson. I think the, one of the first games, I don't, I don't, I touched the ball for about the first fifteen minutes or something. All I done was chase bodies. I was just running about, you know, because they were so good with the ball, they were so good at keeping the ball. And that's a European game. The European games like that, you know, if if you can't look after the ball, then you're not going to, you'll not last long in Europe, you know. But no, certainly great days, great nights. Uh, Playing, playing for the Hibs in Europe, yeah. You played in the first leg against Lage and then missed the return tie. Were Hibs quite unlucky not to, to go through? Yeah, I think that was, was that the one that the guy hit about a 35 yarder or something? And, go, I mind being, by mind being behind the goals, I was on the bench. Uh, I got dropped, Lewis, to be honest. I got dropped. I was devastated. Absolutely, I was gutted. I've never been as low as a football player that night, I remember walking about and, and we were doing all right in the game and the guy and, and I always remember we were on a big bonus that night. <laughs> we were on a big bonus. It was a good bonus for a young boy, you know, at that time you're thinking we're on a big good bonus and the guy picked up a ball for about thirty yards and he hit this ball and I, and I was right behind the goal and watched it. You now to beat Andy Gorham for there for that distance Lewis, you need to be hitting a ball right and I don't think the guy ever scored a goal after that again. I don't think he never I think he'd ever played, scored a goal before it, and I think he ever scored a goal after it. And I just remember, I thought, because the only thing that would have softened me the blow in me not getting a game was the bonus at the end of it, you know? So <laughs> that made it a double blow. So, no, it was a great experience, but, uh, yeah, getting knocked out was, uh, it was a tough one to take. You mentioned Andy Gorham there, who'd obviously end up leaving the club. Mm. Did you know that you wouldn't be able to keep a hold of Andy Gorham much longer? Well, it's just like everything, Lewis, in football, you know, if he was doing so well that it was obviously there was rumours that clubs were in for him, you know, and he was an exceptional goalkeeper, an exceptional goalkeeper. I was lucky to play with a lot of good goalkeepers, you know, Alan Ruff, Jim Leighton, Budgie and then Gorham. So I played with four really good goalkeepers, but Gorham was, was top class, yeah, but when he left... Uh, I told him I wasn't happy with him. I said to him he should have stayed, but I could understand, you know, because they were really playing for Glasgow Rangers at that time. And uh, obviously his salary came in as well because he was obviously looking at looking at his own interests. But uh, no, I didn't. I, I was, wasn't happy with him, but I could understand at that time he was so he was hot and he was he was outstanding, you know. So there was always going to be somebody looking to take him on. Yeah, a, a great goal scoring run, Mickey, in the ninety one ninety two season, and then Hibs ended up reaching the the semi final of the Skull Cup, and you came up against a a pretty decent Rangers side. Did you have full belief that that Hibs had a chance of going through? Yeah, never doubted it. I uh, said this many times. I was a roommate. I was rooming with big uh, Gordon Hunter at the time. He was my my roommate. Never paid any bills right enough. He never paid any phone bills or that, but it was my roommate. Never paid anything, in fact. But uh, and that night, uh, I remember saying to him, you know, we'll win. We'll beat Rangers. We'll win. And he looked at me and I said, you know, I just had a feeling. I thought, you've got a good side with a lot of good players. Uh, and we were playing well. Everything was there. All right, we knew that Rangers were a really good side, Lewis. You know, they had a lot of good players on our side. But I thought, if he turn up, and the players we can, we can beat Rangers, and there was no doubt. But you got to remember, I know when I was younger, I'd played against Rangers and won against Rangers, you know. So I never really feared me because they were the great games to play in these big games. That's the games you want to play in. So I had that in my 
in my mind as well, that not he feared them. But I was always confident if he, if he played the game. And you need a bit of luck against these sides and all, you know. And Burris, Budgie was really good that night. Two centre-hard. But Gordon Hunter was, he was immense. Him and Tom Martin, they were fantastic. Up against Mo Johnson and that. They were, they were on top of their game. So we managed to get through it uh, against a really good side. But no, I was always confident if we perform. Because in their games, at the end of the day, Lewis, you've got to perform, you know, semi-finals or... Finals, whatever you've got to perform on the day, and you've got to got to desire. But the one thing I've always said about that team is we had we had a lot of winners, you know, a lot of winners. Big Keith right up front, always guaranteed. If Big Keith got a chance, he was a great great finisher, Big Keith, you know. Uh, so if you always had you always had a chance if you had if you could get service to him, Big Keith would score your goals. But we had a lot of winners on the team: Murdo McLeod, you know, go through it, Graham Mitchell. Pat McGinley, what of winners. And you need that, Lewis. You need that in these games, you know. You need you need winners, boys that know that want to win so bad that it hurts, you know, and, and we had that. You mentioned uh, John Burridge had a good game and but he also played another role uh, in winding up the Rangers players. What was he like as a character, Mickey? Ah, uh, he was mad as a brush. Mad as a brush. <laughs> Budgie was a but a great man, great man, he, uh, full of confidence. Been there, done it, you know, had the T-shirt. He couldn't help but listen to him because he'd been in the game, I think he was 40-odd year old or something like you know, so he'd been there and seen it all, you know, but he was just such a, an inspiration. For me, I've always said, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen a, a, a player that was so in love with the game of football, you know, so in love with the game. Absolutely, that was his be-all and end-all, was playing football and being a goalkeeper. And he never set his standards so high. It was incredible. But uh, away from it, it was a good lad. It was a really good lad. He was nuts, absolute nuts. But mm-hmm. uh, I, I loved him as a person, as a, as a guy. He was great. And when you've got the guys in front of you, you know, you're looking at them in front of you in the tunnel, you're thinking, you're, you're in a chance here, you know. he's Because he'd been there, played against the best and played in big, big games as well. So, now nah, Budgie, I had a lot of respect for Budgie. A lot of respect, but as I say, Absolutely crackers. You set up the the one and goal for for Keith Wright. Did you ever work on that that understanding, or did that just come natural? No, nah, that's just it was. I've always said to Big Keith. Keith winds me up. He said that. Uh, I've always said to him, listen, though if I couldn't find that big head in that in that eighteen <laughs> yard box, then I must be a bad player, you know. And he always says to me that. That's what made to see that big stretching for all my bad crosses, you see. So we had a bit of everything. Never worked on it one little bit, to be honest, no. But I kind of, I, I kind of quickly learned how to play with Keith Lewis, you know, I kind of, because he made great runs. You know, people forget things like that. And if, if, if players make good runs, it's a lot easier for you as a player, you know, and Keith made great runs. He, him and boys like Darren Jackson and, you know, these type of players, clever players, they made good runs, so they made the pass a lot easier for you, you know, and that's what I learned about Archibald, Archibald was like that, Archie could, he would never be in the game, he'd just make one or two wee great runs, and all you need to do was just hit an area, you know, and and hopefully we'd get an end, and that's what happened that night, it just, I seen him at the back post, and I thought, just hit an area, and hopefully he'd get an end of it, and he did, he got that big ginger head of his on the end, of it and it ended up in the <laughs> So what was the, the build-up like to the, the cup final, Mickey, once you're through? Was was there more pressure? I mean, Hibs were seen as probably the favourites going into the cup final. Massive pressure, Lewis. Massive. Like, I could never, you, you couldn't believe it. It was massive pressure. Because obviously it was my, for my first cup final, you know, and the one thing I said to myself was, we cannot, we cannot lose this. We need to win this final, you know, because so many people... We're counting on us, you know. It was obviously, the season before was a bit dramatic with the takeover and things like that. So, so many people wanted to see us winning the cup. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I can't let anybody down, my family, my friends, all the supporters, so much pressure on it. But a good pressure, Lewis, you know, a pressure that you want as a footballer, not a pressure that you're dreading, you know. It was a pressure that you loved. And I loved that. I loved the, the games like that. But certainly all through the week, up to it, it was it was hard. It was tough, you know, because everywhere you went, Lewis, put the petrol in, you know, go to the shops, wherever you went, somebody would say, you know, 
mind and win the cup, wind and win the, don't come, make sure you win it, make sure you win it, and the pressure builds as you go along, you know, And but as I say, I, I was confident we'd win it, but I knew we had to turn up because cup finals are always, they're always, they're either really good or really bad, you know, there's no in between in a cup final, just how you, how you act on the day, but uh, certainly the build up to it was, there was a lot of pressure, yeah. Did you do any, anything different, Mickey? Did Alec Muller take you away before the cup final? Was it just no, it normal was a, service? Actually, I thought it was a, I thought it was a masterstroke by the manager because he actually asked us, "Would you like to go away or would you like to stay in your own home?" You know, and stay with your own, your family, whatever it may be. And I think the players voted against to stay at their own in their own home for the night. You know, because sometimes when you go away for these games. Uh, the pressure becomes even bigger, you know, and so I think they voted, we voted anyway, and we got to stay in our own home, which I was, uh, I was delighted with because, believe it or not, Lewis, I remember the, the night before it, I went to go and I went to my pals uh, who stayed in Pilton at the time. I still go to see him, Stuart now, and I sat at the window flying his pigeons with him. <laughs> that was my, that, that was me. That was true and. I sat there and flew his pigeon just to take my mind off it, you know, and, I, and it was a big help for me. And guys were saying to me, he, what, he sat and flew pigeons before a cup <laughs> final. I went, ah, I went, ah, didn't bother? That was the way I was, Lewis. I thought, no. And I just, I, I took my mind right off it because my wee mate just spoke about, you know, flying the birds, pigeons, whatever. Took my mind right off it and I woke up in that morning and I was ready. You know, I was ready. Because I think if you're sitting there and you're overthinking it, Lewis, I don't, you've played football, you know what it's like. You know, if you're overthinking it, it can drain you. You know, it can drain you really bad. And uh, it was a, it was a great player for Hibs that taught me about these type of things. The great Eric Shadler that played with the Hibs, he taught me wee, wee nuggets like that. You know how to handle pressure at certain near at certain times of your career. You get away from it, you know, because to go fishing, do something different, change. You know, so you can handle. So it was great advice. So that's what I done, and uh, thankfully it worked for me. You know. You ended up, uh, you started the game pretty well and then won the, the penalty. Was it a penalty, Mickey? Stonewaller. <laughs> I thought you might say that. <laughs> Stonewaller, it was the old, uh, it was, uh, you, may be too, you may be too young to remember, Norman Wisdom, it was old Norman Wisdom 4, it was a Norman Wisdom trick in the box. <laughs> uh, but no, it was a, I thought it was a Stonewaller. Many people will, will disagree with me, but as I say, I've got the medal, Lewis, so I'm not interested what other people think, to be honest, you know, as long as Aye. they won the cup, they the care, you know. Aye, spot on. And uh, you ended up setting up the goal again uh, for Keith Wright, which which wrapped up the game. I mean, what was that moment like when, when Keith puts it away and the game's, the game's done then? Uh, it was a... Uh, never forget that. You never forget these moments, Lewis, you know, just the... Uh, I just remember the support behind the goal, the hub support, and it was like thousands outside Lewis, you know, it couldn't get any of the game, but just packed in, packed to the... I remember just looking, seeing Keith going through with the goal that he beat, and I would have, I would have had everything I had at that time on Keith scoring, because I see he was a great finisher, very underestimated finisher Keith was, and once he went by the goalkeeper, we're 2-0 up, and it's... It's part of Hats and Streamers, Lewis, you know, it's, it's time for the party, time to enjoy it, and, that, and that's the way it went, but I uh, must say, up to the, up to the, that point, we, we struggled in the first half, we never really got going, we had pressure, we, still, we never really relaxed, we were, we were really uptight, and the manager had a great talk with us at half-time, saying, look, you need to just settle down, play your football, he's a good enough, you need to relax, and he's going go and win the cup, and we did it, we relaxed, we once got the second one, yeah, that was a that was a clincher and just the the relief, Lewis. You know the relief he, he picking it up was because Hibs hadn't won a cup for a long time. If people forget, you know, so the relief he actually picking up silverware, especially through the the year before when when Neil lost the club. You know, people forget Neil lost the club. So the relief he won in it for the supporters for everybody was great. And uh, then I knew I could I could go and face my mates again. You know because. <laughs> I honestly think I would have had to I emigrate if I lost that game, to be honest. You also won Man of the Match, Mickey. Does that, see when the final whistle goes and you get Man of the Match, does it does it sink in right away? Because going back to when you said you fell out of love with football and you might maybe have never played and then you go on as a Hibs fan to to win the cup for Hibs, I mean, it must have been incredible. 
Oh, it was. A, it was. It was a. It was a dream come true, really. You know, if you look at it and to win the the man of the match, you know, it'd be. It, Lewis, they type of things never ever bothered me. You know, never ever bothered me. I was all about my team winning. I, I was all about winning as long as we won. You know, if I go great, if you get the man of the match, that's fine. But the most important thing was picking up the medal. You know, and uh, still got it to this day. My young lad is still got it to this day, and I look at it. It's not much like it's only a wee tiny wee thing, you know. But it means a lot for for where I come from, for the background I come from. Absolutely nothing. Brought up in Granton. You know, and heading to Clermiston as a young man, my family never had a great deal. But it meant a lot for me to win, uh, win something for my family who were all hub supporters. You know, it meant a lot for my family and my friends. So that's the way I looked at it. You know, I was just so proud that I'd done it for them all. What was it like being on the, the open top bus? I mean, again, that must have just been surreal for you, Mickey, as a Hibs fan. Ah, it was it was it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy, and just the supporters everywhere you went was just driving by the Maybury. There was supporters everywhere. You know, I always said that Hibs were a big club, Lewis. You know, I've always said that. And I thought people underestimate how big the club is. You know, but that night eh, I was proved right, and I remember a number of players saying to me they didn't realise how big they were. You know, how big Hibs were, and I kept saying, "I'm a big club," and a few, a few deliver success for Hibs you'll see how big they are you know but even, it, it shocked me to be fair Lewis you know because I've seen so many supporters from Maybury all the way through to Barnton right along Christophan and it's just gone on and on and then we arrived at the ground and the whole ground was packed out you know and the supporters outside they were everywhere absolutely everywhere but I just think it was a great night for the club and a great night to get over the previous season you know because it was it was a lot. Of, there was a lot of heartache in the season before because we didn't know what was going to happen to the club, and the relief and to see grown men cry, Lewis. You know, I've always said that. I seen grown men cry in that night, and it was something that will live with me forever. What were the celebrations like? Where did you go after the game? Like, celebrate? Were you able to sit with your family and, and the boys? Yeah, we did. I, I did spend a bit of time, but. Uh, I ended up, we ended up in Edinburgh, I ended up in, uh, some point anyway, I ended up in Buster Browns, you know, I ended up in Buster Browns in Edinburgh, I didn't, I wasn't a drinker as you know, so I don't drink, so, but I enjoyed a good night, I enjoyed the night with the boys, you know, but uh, it was crazy and I, I remember, it's an incredible story actually, I went and, uh, <laughs> I was at Buster's and anyway I left because I was drained, I was absolutely shattered because it's a long day, you know, it's a long night anyway. And I'm walking, I parked my car at Lothian Road, which is a fair bit along because obviously have supporters were everywhere, you know, and so I parked it away along there and uh, I waited till it got a wee bit quieter and I was walking along Lothian Road on my own, you know, and I thought, I'm going to go for a fish supper. So I walked up, I walked up Lothian Road and there used to be a fish chip shop just along up beside the ABC and I went in and got myself a fish supper. Uh, and I'm walking down Lothian Road with a fish supper in my hands and there was two heart supporters across the road to me they were, they were kind of drunk you know and they started giving me abuse that was shouting at me you know and I looked at them the two of them and they were shouting give me abuse and whatever and so here I started to walk and just as I looked drunk they started chasing me <laughs> started chasing me down Lothian Road I thought this is unbelievable people don't believe this I'm running down Lothian Road with a fish supper in my hand getting chased by two heart supporters. So that was incredible, but that's that's just the way it was, you know, but it was, it just went for one. People wouldn't have believed that you just won a cup and then suddenly you're running down East Lothian Road with a first supper in your hand. <laughs> Crazy. I thought it might have been Steve Archibald chasing you for eating a, eating a fish supper, Mickey. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't have, I, I actually wouldn't have liked that one. You ended up spending another five years with the hips, Mickey, but you had a lot of troubles the uh, injuries did that come from, as you said, your time at Luton, obviously playing on the Astro Turfs and uh, a bit of everything, Lewis. A bit of everything. I, I always struggled. I still struggle today, as you know. I struggle with my back, but uh, that was the first season really I'd had a full season. We know having problems with my back and ankle injury at that, that time. It didn't really matter, but I was really struggling. And after that that season. 
it really hit me bad. It really hit me. I was I really struggled. I was never the same player. I was never. I'd lost the uh, the bit of spark in my game that I had, and I knew that, you know. But I was quite proud of myself in terms of getting through it because I did had some dark moments with injuries, you know, and getting told a couple of times that you will not be able to play again. You may you may have to give up the game, and but I just kept going, less, you know. I was thinking, you know, I'll just keep going, but. I knew at some point it was going to, and the season after that, and then the season after that, I was never really what I wanted to be, you know. But I can assure you, if you if you've seen the kind of stuff I had to do just to play games of football, uh, you would have understood it. But I've no regrets about it. But I was disappointed because I wanted to play in more cup finals, you know. I wanted to play in more and. European games, that type of stuff. I wanted more out of the game, you know. But unfortunately, it caught up with me. And, uh, Badly over that three or two or three seasons after that, I was never quite the player I, that I wanted to be. You know, what are your your highlights of that? I know you obviously you had a lot of lows, Mickey, with injuries. But what are some of your highlights of the last few years at the Hibs? And so uh, the last few years at the, the Hibs was just hanging in there, Lewis. You know, just try to hang in there, and and. I always felt was a, I always felt was a challenge for me to just keep going because I knew I was struggling, but I wanted to just uh, play as long as I could for the club, you know. And my biggest one was I wanted to get to a cup final. I wanted to try and get to a Scottish cup final, but it never never happened for me. But the highlights for me really was uh, just playing, just keep playing for the Hibs. You know, that was my highlights. Just keep playing, try and play as many games as possible. And I always had this number in my head. I wanted to play five, six hundred games for Hibs. Never going to happen. Uh, but when I was youngster, when I started off and I, I started getting a run in the team, that was my that was my goal to play four, five hundred games for the Hibs. But I, it just wasn't. I physically wasn't. My body wasn't able to do it. Was to be honest. But no, I just hanging in there to play as much as I possibly could. And uh, and I, ha- I did hang in there for a long, but as I say, I was never at the level I should have been at, you know. How did you end up leaving Hibs? I know that you went on loan uh, to Millwall first. How yeah. did it come that you you would leave the Hibs, Mickey? Well, it was quite a... It wasn't a shock, to be fair, but it was it was very quick. It was a, a severe one, actually, when Jim Duffy came into the club. I have no, I have no doubts that... Jim tried to, to do the best he could for the club, you know, it was just, you know, I, I never disagree with managers, managers, you've got to make decisions, you know, but he, he released me, he asked me, I went into his office and he asked me, he, would you would you want would you like to leave the club? And I went, yeah, well, I'd like to, I don't want to leave, but if I've got to leave, I want to be playing, you know, and he said, well, we'll release you, and I was quite surprised at that, and I thought, okay, but that was my darkest moment. I was walking out Easter Road with a pair of boots in my hands, you know, walking towards my car, and it was horrible to be honest. Walking in the car, sat in the car, tears in my eyes, driving up to the to where I stayed in Edinburgh, gutted, absolutely gutted. But the biggest thing that really haunted me was I never even got a chance to say goodbye to anybody that I knew at the club, you know. And it just, but that's the that's the harsh realities of football, unfortunately. Lewis. That's just the way it is. But uh, going up to to the flat and then getting home. A pair of boots in my hand was something that would lived to me for a long time, yeah, because I just wanted to say goodbye. I never got a chance to say goodbye to the supporters either, you know. So that would that I would have loved to have been a chance to say goodbye to them, but it just doesn't work like that in football. Unfortunately, it's a tough game, it's a brutal game at times. But uh, no, that was a that was not the greatest, to be honest. So you made two hundred and forty-seven appearances for the Hibs Mickey and scored thirty-five goals. How do you look back on your your time with the Highbies? Yeah, I'm, I wasn't happy with what I did. I thought I could have done a lot more. I could have been. I should have played a lot more games. I wanted to play a lot more games, but as I said earlier, Lewis, if if you'd have said to me I played, you know, two hundred, three hundred games or whatever for the Hibs when I was a young man, I would I would have taken that all day long, you know. But you know, say when you get into the game of professional football. You want to play as long as you can. You want to play as much as you can. That was that's my only regrets for being at the Hibs was not playing as many games as I wanted to, and all of that was due to injury and bad form or whatever. But no, when I look back, I was I'm quite proud of what I achieved in terms of uh, my stature. You know, five feet one with my hands up. 
Well, five foot three, my hands are actually. <laughs> but uh, for what for the stature I had, I was quite proud of getting through everything and, and actually playing because uh, always had a always had a fight in my hands, as you know, just being a young young player, being small and having to play at the top level. I'm quite proud of that, you know, and I've, I've always said that to young players, you know, don't give up your dreams, keep going, don't let anybody just say that you can't do it. If you've got the will and the desire, you'll be amazed when you get out of the game, you know, and so I'm, I'm quite proud of that part, but I've got the regrets in terms of wanting to play more, you know, wanting to play more games, not just for the Hubs, but in, in professional football in a whole, I want to play more games. You spent a, a couple of seasons with Motherwell, Mickey. Yeah. Did, did you enjoy your time at Motherwell? Absolutely loved it. Loved it. Uh, I loved just playing, Lewis. I loved playing football, you know. And it was when I went to Motherwell, as you know, we, we were in a bit of a, we were uh, in a relegation battle, you know. So that was something I'd never experienced. I experienced it when I was at Millwall for a loan. They were in a relegation battle. But when I went to Motherwell, this was completely new, you know. It was a, it was a real fight. Especially the first season, we just we just stayed up, and in the second season we kind of we did okay. But by that time I was I was in real trouble with my well back injury. But no, I loved it. Supporters were good with me. Players were good. Played with a lot of good players. Tommy Coyne, Oni Coyle, really good players in that side as well. Uh, a lot of experience. Alec McLeish as manager. Winker Andy Watson, who was the coach. I had the Hibs as well, so I played a lot of good. I played a lot of good games as well, a lot of good games, you know, like Ibrox and Parkhead, these type of games. So, no, I was coming to the end of my career at that time, and I knew that it was just, I was same again. I was just trying to survive, Lewis, you know, just play as long as I could, and it caught me eventually. But uh, I loved every minute uh, the Motherwell, uh, my time at Motherwell. I think the biggest, the best game I played at Motherwell was when we played against the Hibs. Believe it or not, when uh, Motherwell and Hibs were struggling at the time and I came out and I'd never played against the Hibs Lewis, you know, I'd never played against the Hibs so it was a big day for me and I remember working coming out to the game and going towards the Hibs end and the Hibs end all stood up and started clapping and I couldn't believe it I was like shocked and I was, I was, I was, it was a bit of a lump in my throat to be honest because I thought my goodness, I couldn't believe it, I thought I didn't expect that. I was completely shocked. You know, Hibs were in a battle at the time for it to stay in the league. But they had the decency to stand up and clap me on the, into the pitch. Where I thought it was unbelievable. And I never forgot that. You know, and Hibs supporters were so good to me. I was very lucky. And I, but I never, ever forgot that. You know, how how respectful they were that I played for the club, you know. and uh, So that that's always been a... I always think of that as a, a big day in my career, you know. Obviously, you mentioned the Hibs fans singing your name, Mick, and I know you said that you had regrets and you wished that you'd achieve more at your Hibs, but did the fans singing your name kind of help you and kind of make you realise that you did achieve a lot for the Hibies? Yeah, well, definitely. Still to this day, Lewis, I'm still like that, you know. When people come up to me and, and you know, always shake my hand, and I, seem to, I just seem to get on well with the supporters for some reason. I don't know why it was actually, but I just seem to get good. good. So I was very, I was very uh, respectful with the supporters because it, they, I think they knew, you know, me being small and that, they knew that I had a bit of a fight in my hands, Lewis, you know, because they knew every game to me was a battle, you know, every game was a fight. So, but I think they appreciated I gave them a lot. I maybe never played the best every game. But there's one thing for sure, I, I always gave my best, the best I possibly could. I always gave my best for the for the play for the club. So and I was very respectful with them and, and everything that they've done for me. And even now, you know, I, I always I've always got a great rapport with the, the supporters. Brilliant, Mickey. Uh, we're now going to move on to your your old time. I've set you a challenge to pick your old time uh, you have Hibs asked. 11. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is guys that obviously you've watched. Um, as a Hibs fan, Mickey, so... Yeah. Well, I wanted to, I'm glad you never asked me the players that I've played with, Lewis, because that becomes a nightmare, you know, because <laughs> there's people that uh, upset quite a few people, you know, and my texts go, like, mad if I, I don't mention people, so I'm glad you're not. But the best team... So I went over the 11, and uh, that the best players I've seen playing for the Hibs as a supporter, and... Uh, this, my starting lineup would go as 
Let me get a bit of paper. I've got the paper here, Lewis. Let me have a look at it. Aye, no no worries. I don't want to change it because if I change it, I'll get a few texts telling me you're talking a lot of nonsense. So, but the team that I, I liked was, I would go for Gorham and Gold because I think Gorham is the best goalkeeper. Although I've had a lot of good goalkeepers in that time, you know, even when I was younger. But certainly Gorham is the player, the goalkeeper, the best goalkeeper I've seen playing for the Hubs. Uh, but that's not against Jim Layton, Alan Ruff, Budgie, there's a lot of good goalies. But I just went for Gorham as the best. Uh, at right back, I would go for the great John Brownley, who was the best right back I've played for the Hubs. I've seen playing for the Hubs. Uh, had a lot of good, got a good, had a lot of good right backs at the time. You know, it was good players played with the Hubs, but John Brownley. Who's the best I've seen for playing for the Hubs? At left back was a uh, Eric Shadler, who was the hardest player I ever seen and played against, and the hardest trainer I'd ever seen, the most professional player I'd ever seen. So and hard as nails, absolutely hard as nails. As a winger, you wouldn't want to be playing against Eric Shadler, you know. And uh, he was he was a player. Even as a young man watching him in training, and that, he was the ones that I looked, I looked up to because he was hubs through and through, and he was he was an absolute absolute destroyer as a left back. He was hard as nails. So I'm going for him at left back. My two centre halves have gone for John Blackley because John Blackley was good defender, wasn't the quickest, read the game great, hard hard, the bad bad loser. I like a bad loser. At the back, especially, he was a bad loser, a uh, really good player. And then beside him, I'd have to go for Frank Susie, playing the thing, John Blackley, because I think Susie, he had class all about him. Uh, when I seen, I seen a lot of good players playing for Hubs, but Frank Susie, would, I think I'd need to be stupid not to put him in a lineup because he was, he was class. My midfield, I don't know why I set this up, Lewis, but I'm going to go for a midfield. <laughs> uh, I'd probably go for Alec Edwards as a wide right player. He was a genius with the ball, great passer of the ball, uh, could thread passes through. He had a bit about him as well. He had a bit about him. He could he could tackle him. He was a tough tough player as well, but great vision in the, the passing the ball. So I think I'd go for Edwards. I'd always have to go for the king in the middle with the part part Stanton. Uh, had a ring, could run, could pass, could tackle. Class, just class. He used to run the show, and uh, he, he was doing that in training against us. Just trust me, he was still the best player. He just, he just had class all about him. Alongside him, I've got Alec Cropley, who was another great player. Wasn't it? Wasn't a lot of Alec Cropley. Very thin. You know, he looked at me, think a wind would blow him over, but he was hard as nails. Great tackler, great passer. Scored goals, had everything, uh, and could play. So I'd go him. On the wide left, I would go for George Best. Uh, not a bad player, am I? <laughs> not a bad pick. I didn't expect that. George I mean... Best. I would go for George Best. Okay, right. He was kind of at the, at the end of his career when he came to the Hibs. But I've got to say that, you know, even when he came, you could see the bits of him that was unbelievable. Miles ahead of anything, it was anything I'd ever seen playing for the Hubs. Uh, so we go for George Best. Could you imagine him in his, in his heyday, Lewis, you know? Frightening. You know, to say that George Best played for Hubs is something you've got to be proud of. You know, he played for Hubs, so I pulled that one out. Nobody, nobody expected that one. No, I didn't expect that, Mickey. Brilliant. <laughs> we go for George Best. Super. Up front. Uh, I'm going to go for Jimmy O'Rourke, who was a wee striker that scored. I think he scored in his debut in Europe at 16 year old. I think he scored in Europe at 16 year old or 17 year old. And I had a lot of respect for Jimmy O'Rourke because Jimmy O'Rourke was Hubs. It was all about Hubs. Hubs, Hubs through and through. Taught me everything about the game. Taught me everything about Hubs. What it meant to play for Hubs. And he was a great finisher, you know. And he just. Everything about Jimmy O'Rourke was for Hubs. Everything, he is so selfish, he unselfish, sorry, about playing for the Hubs. So I'm going for Jimmy O'Rourke. Alongside him, I've got to go for Stevie Archibald as my striker, played for the Hubs, because I thought he had, 
I will give the same as kind of at the end of his career, coming to the end of his career, but you could see signs of him that he was a yard ahead of everybody. He was a young player at the time, but you knew when the ball went up to Archie, very rarely did it come off him, and he just seen things so quickly, and he was absolutely lethal in front of goals. Uh, he had maybe lost a yard the pace, but certainly as a player, I think Archie would be, he'd be up there, probably the best striker that I played with, not just played with, but watched, seen playing for the Hubs. So that's my that's my loving, and I'm I'm happy I got through that. By the way, because <laughs> I had a lot of thinking because there has been so many good players played for Hubs, Lewis, you know. So I've seen a lot of good players, but that's the ones I would that's the ones I would go for. Top team. Do you think you could get a game in that team? Okay, maybe no. replace replace George Best. No chance. <laughs> wouldn't, they, wouldn't even get on the bench. Wouldn't even get in the, wouldn't even get in the squad, Lewis. Wouldn't they get in the squad, son? But they were exceptional football players, but very lucky to have them to play for the Hubs, aren't they? You know? Ah, you're brilliant. Who would be your manager, Mickey? Who's the best manager that you've you've played but, under? I'd have to go for a, a few of them, eh? Because, I mean, I learned a lot of everybody, Lewis. You know, everybody sees that as a player, but it's true. You learn off, you learn off everybody. Uh, are you talking about a manager I've played under or a manager I've seen? Or... Uh, just that you've played under, just to obviously yeah. manage your, your best 11. I think... Uh, in terms of, although at the time I never really had my run-ins with him, but I think Alec Muller would be a manager that that was up there with the best coaches I'd ever seen played uh, worked with. As I say, I never really had my run-ins with him at times. I had my problems with him, but certainly on the game, I had great respect for his knowledge of the game. He's second to none. Uh, so I was probably going for him, but... I, if we were talking about people I've worked with, I think obviously I've I've been lucky to work. With, I've seen Sir Alex Ferguson at his at his peak as well. You know, when he was at Manchester United, I was lucky to go and and go alongside him with Dave McParland and just learn how the great man worked. You know how the great man done his business. So I would have went for him or then Jock Steen, maybe Jock Steen. Eh? So there's a few of them. Jock Steen obviously was. Uh, Hope we could have kept him at Hibs way back in the day, Lewis. You know, he was a manager that Hibs. Imagine we'd had him as, <laughs> as your manager, eh? So, but if I was looking at the ones I played under, I'd probably come for uh, Alec Miller, yeah. Brilliant. We're just going to finish off with some questions that have been sent in, Mickey, if that's all right. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Sorry for keeping me so long, by the way, Lewis. I knew no, was... no. I... <laughs> I really appreciate your time, Mickey. It's been brilliant. No, um, the first question is from Gordon Barr, my old man, who obviously... I know that you've you've coached uh, back player, in the day. A good player, Gordon was a good player. Good player, Lewis. Very good player. So he's told me, Mickey. He's told me plenty of times. So <laughs> now now you've backed him up. <laughs> he told me he was a good player as well. By the way. <laughs> so he's asked um, first, who is your favourite sportsman outside football? Oh, that's a good question. Sportsman, yeah, outside football. Uh, I like boxing, you know, I, I like boxing, I'm, I'm into a bit of boxing, I, I like all kinds of sports really, it was, I like a winner in a sports, you know, I like I like winners, I like guys who have been there, done it, eh? so if I was probably looking at sportsmen, I'd probably go for uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, he was a boxer that I admired watching uh, way back in the day, I just loved him, he was a winner, he, he, he won all, all the titles and that, but the way he boxed, so I'd go for him as a, but I, I like a lot of Sporting people, you know, but they've they've got to have won something, Lewis. You know what I mean? They've got to have been up there and won things, you know. So I admire a winner, and I admire a winner in sport. I've always been like that. Brilliant. He's also asked, who was your most difficult opponent that you came up against? Oh, yeah. in training or in a game? Would it be just generally? Ah, it could be. Could be any training or games. I played against a lot of good players, Lewis. Lot of good players. I think uh, I only actually played against them for a half, and I'm and I'm glad I only played against them for a half. Was uh, Stuart Pierce at Nottingham Forest, uh, and what actually happened was where Nottingham Forest have their ground is there's a, a big river, as you know, is a big river. So there was a there was a mist that came right over the ground, and I played against them, and for the first twenty five minutes he just booted me as soon as I got near it. <laughs> And a mist came over the pitch and the game got abandoned. So 
that was a game that I was delighted to be abandoned because he was an absolute beast animal. But a very, don't get me wrong, very, very good player. Very good player. But he didn't realise how good a player they are, Lewis, until you're up against them, you know. So he was probably, but I could go through so many. Eric Shadler, David Robertson that played for Aberdeen. There's so many good left backs that I played against. But in terms of how far he went in the game, I think Stuart Pearce would be up there, yeah. Brilliant. Um, Matthew Meyer and Jordan Craig, have, they've sent in similar questions. So Matthew asks, best goal that you scored for Hibs and why? And Jordan's just said, um, the best goal you've scored in your career. So there's there's two best, there. Best game I played, scored for Hibs, best goal I scored for Hibs. Uh, I actually scored a header, believe it or not. I scored, I scored a back post header against Hearts. So anything that I headed, you've got to take that with us as a goal, you know, because I didn't score many headers. So I would go against, I scored against Hearts with a back post header. So I'll take that one as an... Uh, sorry, what was the other question? Uh, it was pretty similar. It was just the best goal you've scored in your career. Best goal I scored in my career? It was probably... My first goal for the Hibs. Don't ask me what it was, Lewis. Don't ask me what it was, but... <laughs> that would be my first, probably the best goal, simply because it was my first goal for the Hibs, you know, and... Uh, I would probably put that down as the, the best goal, simply as I say, because... As a young boy, you're always dreaming about, you know, you could imagine it, Lewis, you know, you probably dreamt it as well, scoring your first goal for the team that you supported uh, all your life, you know, so I'd probably go for that, son. The last question from me, Mickey. Yep. How would you like to be remembered as a footballer? Uh, it's just, just someone that always gave his best, Lewis, you know, always gave his best. So I say, I never... I never played great every week. I don't think any player could say that, but always, always give his best. You know, always went out and gave a hundred and hundred percent effort in every game he possibly could. That's what I always wanted to be known as, as a player who went out there and gave everything, gave his all. I used to say that to many players when I when I was coaching, and I've always said, try and play every game like it's your last game. You know, and that was advice I got for a coach many years ago. And it always stuck by play every game like it's your last, because it may well be your last, Lewis, you know. In football, we just don't know. And I always took that advice, so that's how I'd like to be remembered. Brilliant. And uh, I know you, you said that you, you would have liked to have achieved more, but you lived out Madrid and, and uh, played for the Hibs and managed to be a, a cup-winning player. And for coming on my podcast tonight, I really appreciate it. So I thank you, Mickey. No problem, Lewis. Thanks very much. No worries. Cheers, Mickey. Take care, son. Take Thanks care. very much. Cheers. Bye-bye.